Welcome to Everyday Buddhism, making every day better by applying the proven tools found in Buddhist concepts. Welcome to episode 71 of Everyday Buddhism, making every day better. I'm going to make a brief announcement now before I get into the episode and instead of saving it for the end because I'm excited. Everyday Buddhism is adding a new feature for community and everyday Sangha members. Now, not only do you have the free to members introduction to Buddhism course, a teaching series, blog posts, and the occasional bonus regular size podcast, we are adding regular bonus mini podcast called Contemplations. The first one should be released within the week, followed by relatively regular new contemplations, all presented by myself and some of my Bright Dawn Center of Oneness Buddhism lay ministers and lay ministry students. I cannot wait to hear what you think of them. So, that's a big announcement. Now on with the episode. I was recently asked by my friend Christopher Kakio Ross LeBeau, the founder and sensei of the Salt Lake City Buddhist Fellowship, to give a Dharma talk to his Sangha. He specifically asked if I might talk about the essay Purposeless Purpose from Reverend Gilme Kabose's book, The Center Within. It is that talk combined with a comment I received from one of my Sangha members that is the inspiration for this podcast episode. I titled the talk I gave to Christopher Kakyo Sensei Sangha, Nonsense is Important in Life. I riffed off of Reverend Gilmay's Purposeless Purpose line, drilling deeper into the Dharma to reflect on how important the essence of that phrase is to the path of a Dharma practitioner and how important it is for us in our everyday lives to keep that sort of light touch, not holding on too tightly to concepts and stories in our minds, and not grasping at the appearances of so-called, quote-unquote, reality. Did you know the concept of nonsense that Reverend Gilme talks about is really also based on Mahayana Dharmic principles found in the sutras? Actually, as those of you who have experienced, have had any experience reading the Lotus Sutra, the Pure Land Sutras, or the Prajnaparamita text, the Heart Sutra and the Diamond Sutra, I'm sure you cried out at some time or another in your reading, this is nonsense. I don't understand a word of it. This nonsense that befuddles us with seeming circular logic found in the sutras and nothing that even resembles logic in Zen koans is at the very heart of right understanding and the rest of the Noble Eightfold Path. Reverend Gome spoke to this simply but brilliantly when he wrote, quote, too much intelligence or too much efficiency can create trouble. So we must learn non-intelligence, which is super intelligence. And this is where it all so ties into the question or comment I received from one of my Sangha members after they had listened to the podcast episode 68, The Buddha's Wife, Yusodara and the Buddha with Vanessa Sasan. This Sangha member wrote, quote, I am highly intrigued by the ideas of this fabulous version of Buddhism that was discussed in the episode with Vanessa Sasan. Vanessa talking about how just listening to these stories that are part of other traditions can be valuable lessons really spoke to me. I was wondering if there are any texts you recommend that are more rooted in these traditions of Buddhism that are less secular. I never really thought I'd be interested in this, actually, but it sounded so fun in this podcast conversation. And, you know, sometimes I struggle to stay engaged with Buddhism, so perhaps a more fantastical 
depiction of it would help in some ways, unquote. What a wonderful question. And it was a good insight that was uh, that the listener had and my Sangha member. I was excited to receive that email and happy to talk more about it with them. And so I'll talk more about it in this episode too. I will link this back more directly to the purposeless purpose I began this episode with, but let's, I'm going to go off on a little side story now about what that Sangha member said about struggling to stay engaged with the more secular Buddhism that has seemingly become the Buddhist norm in our country and in, in the West. I am surprised, actually, I haven't heard this comment before. You know, we are a storytelling people. These fabulous stories that are at the, ve- the very heart of Buddhism are brushed aside by many presenting a secular Buddhist approach. And in that dismissal, not only the stories are ignored, buried, but the reason, the why of what the Buddha taught is sacrificed to the altar of purpose, productivity, and getting what we want. Our Sangha is currently studying the Diamond Sutra right now. I'm going to share a bit of verse three and see if you see a similar dialectic at play to what I just shared from Reverend Gilmay's writing about um, non-intelligence being super intelligence. What I'm sharing is the Buddha answering Subhuti's question. And Subhuti was one of the Buddha's best um, students and, and was probably the, the most enlightened, if you will. So Subhuti posed this que- a question in the previous verse, and this was the question. He said, if a noble son or daughter should set forth on the Bodhisattva path, how should they stand? How should they walk? How should they control their thoughts? And that's a very intelligent, important question, right? He wants to know, Subhuti wants to know what we should do, how we should behave if we want to be good bodhisattvas or future Buddhas. So the Buddha answered this, Subhuti, those who would now set forth on the bodhisattva path should thus give birth to this thought. However, many beings there are in whatever realms of beings that might exist, in whatever conceivable realm of being one might conceive of beings, in the realm of complete nirvana, I shall liberate them all. And though I thus liberate countless beings, not a single being is liberated. Okay, that's nonsense, right? (laughs) As nonsensical as Reverend Gome when he wrote, so we must learn non-intelligence, which is super intelligence. You know, the Diamond Sutra is full of this quote unquote nonsense because it is one of the Prajnaparamita texts. Prajnaparamita means perfect wisdom or the perfection of wisdom or the perfection of transcendent wisdom. That sounds a lot like super intelligence, right? The Prajnaparamita texts reveal the superpower of the Dharma because the wisdom it contains is transcendent. You can't get there from here. <laughs> by ordinary wisdom means or intelligent means. And you certainly can't get there by what is normally considered intelligence. You can only get there by learning the non-intelligence that Reverend Guillaume spoke of. Too often, I see people coming to Buddhism attracted by the mental bling they see hiding in these and all the other sutras or or driven by a commitment to push themselves to enlightenment like someone dragging themselves to the gym. And although those paths can lead you to something that makes you feel like your life has gotten better, my experience tells me it is like taking what is considered the smartest or most efficient way to a new destination, thinking it is the best way, only to find out it actually takes longer and ends up bringing you to a place that once you get there, you realize you didn't want to go. 
and sometimes a frantic stab at Google Maps when you're lost can create the exact same problem. You know, I started my journey into Buddhism grasping at the mental bling. You know, the list, the debates, the philosophy. My initial reason for wanting to understand more about Buddhism really was that I wanted more emotional and mental peace. Then, before you know it, all that intellectual glitter caught my eye and I tumbled into thinking, I must learn all these lists, I must learn all these schools and all these teachings and read all the sutras and on and on and on and on. Needless to say, I didn't find the peace I was looking for. Just more striving, more confusion, more feeling like I wasn't quite enough. So dipping back into Reverend Gilmay's essay, he wrote, quote, if we continually live in the midst of purposeful, directed activity, soon we will feel pressured and must enters our lives. There is no naturalist. In the book, Heard by Me, Essays on My Buddhist Teacher by Shuichi Maeda, another student of Reverend Haya Akagarasu, like Reverend Gyome Kabose was, Maeda writes this, quote, I am most grateful that Reverend Akagarasu gave me absolute freedom. I am not obligated to him in any way. There is not even one thing that I must do because I am his student. If I am myself, that's good enough. But what else could I be besides myself? I have not received any dharma from my teacher to transmit to others. I just live as myself. And then he went on to say, my teacher has a poem. And here's the poem. There is no my dharma to be transmitted. There is no my student either. There are only the stars twinkling in the high sky, unquote. What I have learned about the Dharma through Reverends Koyo and Gyome Kabose is just that, to live as myself. No striving, no grasping after the Dharma, no grasping at teaching, just living as myself, which includes reading and reflecting on the Dharma and talking to others about it, but not in a way to get anywhere but in a way to experience the Dharma in my life and see how it is being lived in the lives of others. I try not to conceptualize my Dharma practice in any other way, like checking to see if I'm being the perfect student or being a better teacher, or even though the Bright Dawn lineage, and even though the Bright Dawn li lineage is built on rebels, like from Shinran on down to Reverend Koyo Kabose, what they taught has its basis in all the sutras. Revisiting the so-called quote-unquote nonsense we sampled before from the Diamond Sutra, here's an explanation on how a bodhisattva in training should behave, as quoted uh, from a Chinese master in Red Pine's commentary on the Di Diamond Sutra. Quote, when you're happy, I'm not. When you're sad, I'm not. A crane thinks of flying north or south. A swallow thinks of his old nest. Autumn moon and spring flower thoughts never end. You only need to know yourself right now. Unquote. And Red Pine further quotes another Chinese master and poet, um, in response to the Buddha's answer to Subhuti's question about not a single being being liberated, quote, Manjushri once asked the Buddha, what do you mean when you say not a single being is liberated? And the Buddha replied, our nature is ultimately pure and subject to neither rebirth nor nirvana. Thus, there are no beings to be liberated and there is no nirvana to be attained. It is simply all beings revert to their own nature, unquote. Knowing ourselves 
is not about building up our ego self nature, but about seeing it and also seeing our non-self nature or Buddha nature. Yet the promise from the Prajnaparamita texts and from Reverend Gyome and from life itself seems to be that in the no attainment that we talked about in the Prajnaparamita text is also the purposeless purpose Reverend, Reverend Gyome speaks of. So what we are left with is life as it presents itself to us and in us. But to understand that, We need to relax. We need not to try to be anyone else but ourselves being aware of what is happening at the moment. My overall word of advice for enjoying being a student of the Dharma is to relax and not try to figure it out. Honestly, one of the main points, if not the whole point, of practicing with the Prajnaparamita Sutras is to not try and understand it. That is what these sutras are teaching. It's not understanding. It's not about concepts. It's about living. Red Pine wrote that once you understand about not trying to understand, quote, you may find the Diamond Sutra like a piece of beautiful music. Without straining at all, the meaning will just enter you, unquote. And sometimes in that relaxing, you'll discover the Dharma, you'll discover life, you'll discover yourself. And it is my experience that without a little goofing off, right, (laughs) you can never really understand anything or never really non-understand anything. That's the advice I leave you with. It's the advice I got from my own journaling to myself some 30 plus years ago, When I had to leave my job due to systemic lupus and I was depressed because I wasn't being productive and I didn't know who I was if I wasn't this thing that I was when I was working. A sentence came out of me in that journal that I had no recollection of intending to write, planning to write. I didn't form the words. It was, quote, you are the hero of fun, unquote. Now, I realize that sounds ridiculous. Nonsense, you say. But it is only in rediscovering that sense of, if not fun, then childlike wonder and joy that I have come to understand and relax in life as it is. In that relaxing in life as it is, the doors to awareness are thrown open and everything looks a little clearer a little brighter, a little more alive. This advice comes from many, not just Buddhist teachers and writers. And I'll leave you with a similar bit of advice that I suggest you put into practice on some days every month. It comes from a favorite poem of poem of mine, and it might even have been this favorite poem of yours, if you remember it. It was from Song of Myself, from the book Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Quote, I celebrate myself, and from what I assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good as belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. That's it for today's episode. Don't forget that you can join me and others in the private donation-supported Everyday Sangha that meets virtually via Zoom every other week on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time. The Sangha is currently studying, as I said, the Diamond Sutra. And please consider supporting the efforts of this podcast and related groups by becoming a community member for $5 a month. If you do, you will have access to blogs, members-only podcasts, an education series, a private Facebook group, the Introduction to Buddhism class, and that new bonus contemplation series of podcasts. 
If you don't follow me or Everyday Buddhism on any social media platforms we post in, you can go to the Everyday Buddhism website and join the membership community or the Everyday Sangha. Go to www.everyday-buddhism.com and click on the tab that says Join Community or Sangha. I can't stress enough how thankful I am to those of you who do donate or join our groups since I do not seek podcast sponsors and do not ask for financial commitments through paid podcast memberships. My work and the cost of the infrastructure needed to support what I do is entirely self-funded, except for your donations. Thanks, too, to all of you who write in with comments and questions. I do read everything but can't always respond. Another way you can help is to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It's important to share the podcast with others if you find it helpful in your life. And if you could, right now, take a minute to comment so people will know why you love Everyday Buddhism. If you like this podcast and aren't already aware I wrote a book in the same everyday style called Everyday Buddhism, Real Life Buddhist Teachings and Practices for Real Change. Look for it on Amazon. I've posted a link to it in the show notes, and if you've read it, please take a minute to rate and review that. That's all for the announcements, and that's all for this podcast episode. So until next time... Keep finding ways to make yours and everyone's days better.